I am going to be talking to you today about spiritual considerations and pain management. Um, I want to offer a little disclaimer that I know sometimes this topic can bring up a lot of different things for people. So I invite you to sit with that and, you know, discover what it means for you as we talk through it. My goal today is to share with you some information about what the research tells us and how religiousness, religious identity, spiritual identity can have an impact both on health and on pain and to kind of offer up some ideas of how you might consider that for yourself. So I just want to offer that I know that it can um, bring up some feelings and just to, to appreciate that. And you'll, you'll see my attempts at considering that as we move through together. All right, so I first want to establish a common understanding of the condition that I mean when I talk about pain management. So, you know, we know that there is this definition of chronic pain. A lot of you might identify with this or know someone who is impacted by this. I think it's important to note how widespread the condition of chronic pain is, how many people it affects, 50 million people in the United States. Things we know about chronic pain, it's both a sensory experience in your physical body as well as an emotional experience. We know that it's associated with either actual tissue damage or even potential tissue damage and that chronic pain persists and continues for months or even years beyond an expected recovery. So an important piece of how we define chronic pain is how we also help to explain it. How do we understand how to treat chronic pain, how to manage chronic pain? Some of you might have heard of this term, especially if you attended the last talk, called the biopsychosocial model of pain. So if you split that up, we've got the biological piece with several factors. We've got psychological factors, and then we have social factors that are all impacting that common condition of pain. And I realize this might be a little bit small, so I'll walk you through some of these. So we can start with the biological factors, what a lot of people most readily identify in their own pain experience is what that sensory experience is like and how their biology is contributing to that. So we've got the severity of a specific disease or diagnosis. That, of course, is going to impact a person's pain. We have what we call nociception. So nociception is a fancy way of saying something is going on in your peripheral body, your extended body, outside of your brain or your spinal cord. There's something going on there that's triggering an experience. Um, so for instance, if I were to trip and stub my toe, the experience at my toe would be nociception that's creating pain from that place in my body. Um, we've got inflammation that's occurring within the body. And then of course, brain function is also impacted in our biology. Our brain is really the computer and the powerhouse and the detector of a lot of different things. So our brain is necessarily involved in how we process pain. We've got psychological factors. So mood, how a person feels in the day, whether that is fluctuating from day to day, or even if someone is struggling with a specific mental health diagnosis that might be longer term, we know that that can impact a person's experience of pain. Part of how we know that is because those, um, the areas of the brain that are processing pain are also the same areas of the brain that are processing our emotions. And so they necessarily have an overlap in the sensory experience that is created. You'll see also this word catastrophizing, which may or may not sound familiar to you. The pain research tells us that there are certain ways of thinking about or interpreting a sensation that can be um, less helpful, that can actually lead to more severe experiences of pain. And one of those unhelpful thought styles is what we call catastrophizing. Essentially what that means is imagining the worst possible outcome of a situation. And you might imagine again, you know, we've got pain in the middle here because that's what we're talking about, but this model actually applies to a lot of different areas of our health. Of course, psychological factors include stress, which again can be day to day or can be chronic as related to a health condition like pain, which in and of itself is a stressor. And then coping specific coping strategies that people use both to deal with the psychological factors that live there and with all the other things, right? So how do we cope with health, with changes that we have to make to our health? And then social factors. This really taps into a person's environment, a person's um, social setting. It could also be, um, there are contributions from people's economic factors as well, right? So if you imagine something like um, I think insurance was mentioned as the topic that's coming up. If you imagine something like insurance, that is a social factor that impacts not only the access somebody might have to care and how they can manage their biological factors, but also the stress that is imparted 
by all of those things. And all of those things are contributing to pain in the middle. So you can see that we have this really testable model, right? It's not a very testable model when you have several arrows. But we've got a lot of arrows that are really helping to explain this concept and to understand how all of these things are working together. So where does religion and spirituality come in? Well, you know, I might argue that it comes in in several different parts we've talked about, but there is a model called the biopsychosocial spiritual model, which says that essentially religion and spirituality are another section here that are impacting pain. And also that your environment as a whole is a context for all of that. So I wanna introduce this by proposing this model that says that religion and spirituality are impacting a person's experience of pain because of how they are related to these three core topics. How a person imparts meaning in their life, how they make sense of themselves, how they make sense of the world around them, and the interplay between those two. How they create purpose, so how they understand their purpose in the world, and then how they view themselves, how they identify. So if you just take a second to think about what comes up for you when you think about the idea of religion or spirituality and belief in something bigger, and maybe consider that, yeah, does, does it make sense to me that these three things might be related? That's what the model is proposing. I also want to appreciate that it can be hard to come up with the right words to describe what we experience around this type of thing. So there is the word religion, there is the word spirituality, there are words like belief, like faith, like higher power. I wanna offer that as I'm sharing this with you, you can consider whatever word makes the most sense to you because I think it will be applicable based on the, what the research has shown. And also some of the limitations of the research are that they're really tapping into this dimension of religiousness but that's not all that can be valuable in this model. So I just wanna offer that. And with that, offer this idea of spirituality as a greater concept. Again, thinking about whatever word in that concept makes the most sense for you. So spirituality as defined by these researchers, I really appreciated their definition. It's an experience that incorporates a relationship with the transcendent or sacred. Again, however you might define that. Spirituality then provides a strong sense of identity or of direction. It also has a strong influence on a person's beliefs, their attitudes, their emotions, and their behavior. And thereby, it becomes a really important and integral part of their sense of meaning and of their purpose in life. So I wanna offer this to you as the definition as we walk through this together. <clears throat> I also thought it would be interesting just to share sort of what the state of identity is among these topics in the United States. So these are some statistics I found from the Pew Research Center. The data was collected in 2017. So what you're seeing here is the top two lines that are in darker blue and that are bolded are statistically significant changes from the data from 2012 to 2017. So overall, what we find in 2017 is that 25% of Americans, just about, are seeing themselves as spiritual but not religious. And about 50% of people are seeing themselves as religious but not spiritual, which is a decline from five years prior. Um, so again, I just wanted to offer some background of sort of what the state of that kind of identity is in the United States. Um, I think also interesting to consider in this survey is that people were asked two separate questions. One, they were asked, do you identify as religious? And two, they were asked, do you identify as spiritual? So the survey data is a combination of those two questions. And also the changes that occurred across those five years were consistent across a number of different demographic variables. So consistent across men and women, that those changes in the first two areas occurred, consistent across different ethnic groups, across ages, education levels, and political affiliation. Another way that we can understand what people's beliefs are is by how they understand their own belief in God, right? So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different ways that we can see this. It can be a belief in something bigger. It can be a specific set of beliefs. So I just wanted to offer this as some information too. Um, another Pew survey from 2017 showed that about 33% of U.S. adults believe in something higher, but not necessarily as God described in the Bible. 
So again, just to kind of share how there are some different ways of conceptualizing a person's belief. And then you can see kind of some statistics across the board. They're ranging from 56% identifying as believing in God as described in the Bible over to 10% who don't really um, identify with a sense of belief in anything higher. So how does all of this apply to health? So you might see on my, some of my slides that I write R slash S, that's referring to this idea, this broad concept of religion and spirituality. So some of the things that the research tells us, the research tells us that this idea of positive religious coping is associated with better health outcomes. And I'll come to kind of what that means. What is positive religious coping? The research also tells us that when someone is struggling in a spiritual sense, so when they're experiencing some conflict in that domain of their life, it's associated with poorer health outcomes. Additionally, the research tells us that um, religious attendance or worship can actually impact a person's life expectancy. And in general, we know that patients report increasing use of prayer, which is a religious coping strategy, in order to address their health concerns. So what do I mean when I say religious coping? Well, the first aspect of this is that it's a way to translate a specific religious belief or a practice into a strategy, into a strategy that helps a person cope during stress. We know that actively coping, actively using some behaviors that are grounded in a belief or practice predicts better health outcomes than simply being religious. And the way that this um, particular author defined being religious is like a frequency of prayer or a frequency of attendance at a worship service. So that was the general measure in comparison to this idea of actively using certain strategies to cope. The other thing that the research tells us is that there's both positive and negative aspects of coping. So it's not necessarily just some umbrella term that we would use. So let's talk a little bit more about what the different types of coping are. Um, I've broken up um, some, some theories here about four different types of coping. So there's this idea of deferential coping. So that is a person who might give all of their control to their higher power, to whatever that sense of belief in something greater is, that greater thing has all the control. So a person who identifies as a deferential coper might say something like, I'm leaving it in God's hands. If we think about collaborative, that one's pretty straightforward. This person identifies as having this sort of joint partnership, this sense of problem solving, this sense of collaboration with their higher power. So someone who identifies as collaborative might say something like, God will watch over me and it's my responsibility to go to my doctor's appointments, or it's my responsibility to check my blood sugars or to get my annual checkup. That type of statement would apply to that person. Then we have independent, which there are a couple of different ways that the research addresses this. It can be sometimes also called self-directed. So this is a person who perhaps doesn't have a belief in a higher power, and thus the higher power is not involved in how they cope. Alternatively, um, this person could also have a belief but still see themselves as being the primary driver of their own health care. So someone who identifies as independent or self-directed might say, I'm on my own to make sure I stay healthy or I'll do it myself. There's nothing else that's controlling or impacting my health. The abandoned coping style is a person who might feel abandoned by their higher power. And then again, thus the higher power is not involved. So you can see across these top two, what they have in common is that this person's higher power does have a sense of involvement in their healthcare overall. And on these lower two here, again, pending the definition of independent, the higher power is not involved simply because the person either does not believe in God or feels abandoned by God or however they define God. So in terms of thinking about these different styles and how they actually impact people's health, the research does tell us that there are differences. The first thing I'll share is that for the independent style of religious coping, the findings are mixed, which makes sense given that it can be defined based on whether or not a person believes in God or whether they just think that they're on their own to cope with their health. So that has some mixed findings. Um, if we think about the abandoned coping style, that generally tends to have association with strong negative outcomes. If a person is using strategies that are more aligned with that concept. 
And when I say strategies, it might even be just how a person talks to themselves, how they think about or make meaning of a certain situation. Um, deferred coping or deferential coping also tends to have an association with more negative outcomes. And that is largely because it lacks a sense of responsibility um, and a sense of power, if you will, what we call self-efficacy, the idea that someone can actually create change in their own healthcare. So it's not terribly surprising that it might be less associated with good physical and mental health outcomes. And then lastly, the collaborative style of coping, again, when we're looking at different religious coping, is associated with the best mental and physical health outcomes. So now I wanna narrow this down and really explore what are the research findings around religious coping for folks who have chronic pain. So what we know in survey data of patients who have been surveyed at clinics similar to the Stanford Clinic is that prayer is the number one or number two coping tool used by pain patients. This wasn't picked from a list. This was people were asked, what do you use to cope with your pain? And prayer was either the number one or number two answer given. 61% of pain patients report using prayer to help with pain. Um, other research findings also suggest that people actually increase their use of prayer in the context of managing chronic pain. Other things that we know are that 40% of pain patients actually report becoming more religious or spiritual with the onset of their pain condition. Um, there is also research to suggest that some people become less religious and spiritual with the onset of their pain condition. I also want to highlight this difference between um, believing something and then acting with it, which sort of speaks to what we had talked about a little bit before in um, actively coping versus just being religious. So part of what the research tells us is that folks who had some sense of religious or spiritual identity prior to the onset of their pain have better outcomes when they use tools that are associated when they use religious and spiritual coping tools. Um, in contrast, prayer as a strategy tends to be ineffective for people without a general faith system. So people who didn't have this sense of belief or a well-formed one, at least, prior to their pain condition, who then are recommended to use prayer or suggested to use prayer, it tends to not be effective. And part of what we think about this is because um, in that context, prayer might be being used as a test of faith or as kind of a last ditch effort. And so again, if we're thinking back to those coping styles I just reviewed, that lacks a little bit of sense of control and so might be associated with worse outcomes. So does it work? Does religious or spiritual coping actually help? So the things that we know are that the use of prayer, the use of religious and spiritual coping can decrease medication use among pain populations. And positive religious or spiritual coping has a really positive, uh, a strong effect, I should say, on what we call pain tolerance. So pain tolerance is the idea that someone can manage their pain and continue to function. In contrast to this concept of pain sensitivity in which um, that would actually vary the level of intensity, if you will. So religious and spiritual coping hasn't been shown in the literature to actually affect sensitivity but it does affect tolerance. And if we think about what tolerance means, it means a person can actually do more with their life. So that's certainly an outcome that we, we do value and that is important. In contrast, negative religious or spiritual coping can predict a poorer recovery, can predict poorer return to activities, um, to, to quality of life activities. I also wanna highlight that the findings don't necessarily go in that pretty direction of positive religious and spiritual coping as positive outcomes and negative religious and spiritual coping as negative outcomes. Not for every person. So there was another study that was done that I'm highlighting in this last piece on this slide here with um, a group of over 400 Australian pain patients. They categorized people into low faith and high faith groups. And in fact, in this particular study, the low faith group reported greater enjoyment in their life felt more engaged in their life, felt more functional in their life. And one of the potential reasons for this is because how people identify with the concept of God or the concept of their higher belief can make a difference. So for instance, some people in the high faith group might have identified with the sense of a loving or benevolent higher power. In contrast, some people might have identified with a punishing higher power. And so they posit that that can potentially 
have an impact on how someone actually goes about and engages with their life. I think something else that's interesting to note here too is that research has also been shown that when people are more open-minded to the concept of religion or spirituality, so not necessarily identifying anything, but just more open to the idea in contrast to, I don't believe anything is out there, there is nothing out there, they tend to have better pain outcomes. So I think that's an interesting um, piece as well. So if we're considering uh, why some of these negative strategies might lead to poor outcomes, then uh, it's important to note also what, again, that mind-body overlap is. So some researchers have suggested that maybe negative beliefs about religion, about spirituality, are activating what we call the limbic system. The limbic system in your um, brain is essentially responsible for emotions. So negative thoughts, beliefs may flood negative emotions and all of those things are gonna to contribute to a person's experience of pain, creating sort of a cascade effect, if you will. So I've been hinting a lot at this idea of different patterns of coping. I wanna share a couple of concepts with you in terms of how we make sense of different patterns of coping. So what does it mean to have a positive pattern of religious or spiritual coping? So this is partly what some of the um, theorists in this area would tell us. Positive patterns have a sense of spirituality, so you might consider that definition I offered of spirituality before. Positive patterns also tend to have a more secure relationship with God. So in contrast to perhaps um, more of a testing type of relationship with God. Um, positive patterns also have a sense that there is meaning to be found in life, that that is part of how the strategy helps a person move through their life is because it imparts a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. And positive patterns also tend to incorporate the sense of connection with others. So a sense of community. In contrast, negative patterns are gonna be characterized by a less secure relationship with God, maybe a tenuous or ominous view of the world, and perhaps also a religious struggle in search for significance. And so, you know, I mentioned before that there are some negative outcomes around the idea of struggle. That's not to say that struggle is not supposed to happen or is bad, but sitting in the struggle versus processing the struggle is what we would characterize as more of a negative pattern of coping. I also want to share with you what the, some specifics are. So we've narrowed it down from understanding coping to the different coping styles to understanding that they have a positive and negative flavor, but how does this actually map out? What does this look like for people? So on the left side there, you'll see a list of positive coping strategies and I'll share with you um, what some of them are. So spiritual connection, pretty obvious, seeking a sense of connectedness. And that is in general, the connectedness to your belief system, your higher power, however you see God. Spiritual support is that sense of connecting with other people. So connecting in your community, not necessarily just with your higher power. Um, it's also getting at this concept of seeking comfort and reassurance through your spiritual identity, through your belief system. There's also a concept of forgiveness that runs through the positive coping aspect. So there is asking for forgiveness and there is also um, getting assistance through your religious beliefs to forgive others. Um, I think another important aspect of the forgiveness is being able to let go of certain negative emotions. So I mentioned before that negative thoughts, beliefs can activate negative emotions through our limbic system and that those things can then have a cascading effect on pain. So um, that's one of the components of forgiveness and how that can be helpful. So working on forgiveness for things like anger, hurt, or fear. There's also this concept of reappraisal. So reappraisal is this idea that a situation occurs and now I have to sort of run through how to make sense of that situation. So reappraisal would be me working out in my mind as to how I make sense of or explain something. So a positive coping strategy is what is being referred to here as benevolent religious reappraisal. So that would be redefining a stressor or making sense of a stressor as something that's potentially beneficial. That is, for instance, to say like for a person's highest good as benevolent. Another aspect of this strategy is using religion as distraction or having a positive religious focus. So this might look like a person seeking relief from a stressor 
by moving their attention into that which they believe in, um, moving it onto religion, for example. And then coming back to something that's familiar from previous slides, this collaborative problem solving. So collaborative problem solving is a person is working to make sense of or seek control of the situation in a partnership with God so that their higher power has some aspect of it and they too also have some aspect of it. The negative coping strategies, again, you know, this concept of strategy implies that it's active. Sometimes these things happen a bit automatically, but are still a behavior or still present. So spiritual discontent is a person expressing a sense of dissatisfaction or confusion with their higher power. The interpersonal component of that is that a person is expressing those same sentiments to a member of their group. So for instance, to clergy, to other people who are in their same belief or faith group. Punishing God reappraisal, again, that ma manner, that method of making sense of a situation. So this would be redefining as a, a stressor as a punishment from God. Um, so that might involve thoughts or self-talk like God is punishing me. And the research tells us that statements like that can increase a person's pain sensitivity and can heighten a pain experience. Again, because of what we know from the mind-body connection and how systems of the brain, areas of the brain, I should say, that are um, processing emotion are also the same areas of the brain that are sort of making the decision, if you will, about whether something in the body is interpreted as pain. Okay. Um, and I think that's also interesting considering that a lot of the research shows that this positive coping helps with the tolerance, as I mentioned before. So this left side that you're looking at helps people be more functional in their lives. And then this right side over here can actually increase the experience of pain. So it's a little bit of a um, double whammy, if you might say, to kind of think about what the costs are associated and the benefits that are associated. Demonic reappraisal is redefining the stressor as an act of, a, act of the devil or sort of whatever the complement a person believes to their higher power and how they understand that. And then the last aspect of reappraisal here is redefining, reassessing how a person even interprets God's power. So um, like questioning God's power or God's control as a manner of coping. So to help put some of this all together, I want to share this image with you of some potential pathways. So we've been talking about a lot of different areas here. And I just, like I said, kind of want to put this together for you. So at the top left there, you have spiritual beliefs and practices and a couple of different dimensions on each of those. They can be that positive or negative coping as we just reviewed. They could be public or private. They could be intrinsic, so driven by the person themselves or extrinsic, like motivated by the influence of other people. They can be existential, so some belief in something bigger. They could be religious, so really specific to a certain set of beliefs. Those beliefs and practices are then going to make a difference in a person's psychosocial world, right? How they make meaning of the world, how much power they think they have. So that's that self-efficacy piece. How much can I create change? An interesting way to think about self-efficacy that I always think is a sweet and helpful example. If we think about babies who are lying on their back in their crib, staring up at a mobile, as they're developing and learning how they interact with the world, what's the purpose of a mobile? Why do, why do parents hang mobiles above the crib? So that the baby will reach out, touch it, and when that mobile moves by the baby's touch, that's how the baby knows, I have efficacy. I can create change in this world. So I think that's an interesting way to sort of think about how that plays out in our adult lives too, in terms of how we, how we can interpret our ability to make change. Spiritual beliefs and practices also have an impact on whether a person um, kind of is able to utilize distraction, is able to shift focus, how they're able to get support, and how they're able to achieve relaxation. So it's highly likely that all those 61% of people who report using prayer to manage pain are finding it successful because of its relaxation properties for them. Also impacting that are these unique factors that are um, specific to a person's religious or spiritual identity, like the sense of support that they get from their faith, the sense of growth that they experience along the trajectory of their faith or their belief system. All of those things are then impacting the physiological and neurological changes. So I've already shared with you a little bit some of the research that suggests that some of these beliefs 
about religion, about spirituality, about one's relationship to something greater can impact a person's physical experience of pain. And so that's getting at some of the different ways that that can occur, changing chemicals in the brain, changing how pain signals are um, sent from top down, bottom up, if you will, from the body up to the brain, from the brain back down to the body, and then changing thresholds for recognizing pain signals. One of the things that uh, the biopsychosocial model tells us and some theories after that, which is actually next month's topic, the gate control theory, part of what the gate control theory tells us is that depending on our um, environment, if you will, the brain can send more or less signals back down to the body. There can be a smaller threshold, a smaller window, if you will, for the brain to send signals down or a bigger one. So in that situation, we actually want a more narrow one. We want fewer signals being sent down, especially in um, chronic pain conditions. So that's what that's referring to there. And then all of that amounts to a person's perception of pain being altered, being shifted. And it gets out there that there's multiple dimensions. It can be increased or decreased. And we can be talking about sensitivity or tolerance. And then in this model, the, the idea is that that experience of pain is cycling back around to a person's spiritual beliefs and practices. So simply put, if something works, we do it again. If something doesn't work, we might stop doing it. So I've started to hint at a bit this concept of meaning making. And you know, ultimately, I believe that that is really the key point in all of this. Why does religion and spirituality matter? Well, because for so many people, it is how we make sense of the world. Um, whether it's our absence of belief that helps us make sense of the world or our connection and adherence to a certain set of beliefs that helps us make sense in the world. But ultimately, those things that contribute to how we understand ourselves, the world around us, and that interplay are really powerful. So when I say meaning, what I mean is this concept of personal significance, of purpose, of having a causal explanation, understanding the why, and also that search for meaning can be a coping style in and of itself. So one of the things we know in terms of um, brain functioning, meaning making, religion and spiritual coping, there have been some studies done um, where they took CAT scans of Franciscan nuns and of Buddhist practitioners. And both of these groups were asked to engage in a meditation. They each engaged in a meditation and what the brain scan showed afterwards is there was activation in different parts of the brain. So one thing that that tells us is there are brain changes when we meditate. <laughs> the other thing that, that, that they saw is that the patterns were the same between the two groups. So their religious or spiritual affiliation didn't matter for them to get this change of effect with meditation. However, what was so interesting is that each of these two groups, when they were told, hey, we saw different parts of your brain light up when you were meditating and they were asked, what did you think? So the nuns felt that it captured a moment of closeness to God and of mingling with him. The Buddhists felt that it was a presence of inner peace. Now, as we're reading this, if you don't necessarily identify with either of those groups, you might think, huh, those sound pretty similar. But if we kind of imagine for a moment that we belong to either one of those groups, we can see how there's some nuance there. We can see how a person's own set of beliefs and beliefs about that specific behavior of meditating and what it does can influence how they actually make sense of different patterns of brain activation. I have another study here for you that actually has a picture to go along with it. So this was an fMRI study in which they um, examined pain intensity between Catholics and people who identified as atheist and agnostic. So in this particular study, they were actually inducing pain among their participants. So they had, um, if you can imagine kind of a square, each of the groups ran through each of the conditions. Each condition was for them to be shown a picture of an unidentified woman and of the Virgin Mary. So both the group of um, Catholic identified participants and atheist agnostic identified participants saw each of these images while being exposed to a painful stimulus. So um, they had what I identified as three major findings. The first is that each group preferred the image that matched their own belief system. So the people who identified as Catholics preferred the image of the Virgin Mary. The people who identified as non-religious preferred the unidentified woman. 
The next thing that I found really interesting is that the religious individuals reported less pain in the condition where they viewed the Virgin Mary. So religious people who were being exposed to a picture of Virgin Mary and exposed to a painful stimulus reported less pain than when they were exposed to this unidentified woman and less pain than the non-religious individuals exposed to the Virgin Mary. Um, the other thing that was interesting, as I mentioned, it was an fMRI study, which is taking um, MRI images of the brain while someone's actually participating in an activity. The uh, religious individuals, when viewing Virgin Mary, had greater activation in parts of the brain that are responsible for pain reduction. So what do we take away from that? One of the takeaways to me is that when a person identifies something as meaningful and potentially um, able to connect with that in a positive way, in a positive, positive, meaningful way, it has a real effect on how they experience their pain. And of course, the fMRI also showed us it has a real effect in how their brain is processing that as well. And, you know, one of the highlights here is that the context matters. These effects were not present for the folks who identified as not religious. So they um, weren't necessarily soothed by the other image. So we'll continue on. Um, I'll just briefly touch on um, meditation as a, as a coping strategy too for something that's not necessarily specifically identified with any one religion or spiritual belief. So even things that are um, broader, if you will, broader in their, um, in who can identify with them can have beneficial effects. So people who meditate experience less unpleasantness from their pain. We also know that meditation is more effective for people who are practiced at it versus people who are novice at it. And that makes sense, right? When we practice a strategy or a skill, we get better at using it. Um, and then it results in less activation in emotion processing centers. I'm gonna skip that next piece for the sake of time. I think hopefully I've already helped lead up to this point that meaning is a key component of chronic pain management. So I hinted at a few things that are really um, more fully explored in some other lectures, but this concept that pain is a signal. At, at its heart level, pain is a danger cue. It's a signal for acute injury. It's meant to alert you to something. It's meant to treat an injury or to prevent a further injury. So I um, gave the example earlier of stubbing my toe. That pain from my toe is meant to tell me, hey, be more careful when you walk on that toe so you don't actually break it, right? So that pain is helping me prevent injury but not necessarily indicative of specific tissue damage. But in the chronic phase, there's not always an injury for us to treat. Maybe it was never identified. Maybe we're past the point of healing. Maybe we have a lot of things that confirm that injury is healed and yet pain persists. And so how do we understand that pain? How do we make sense of why that pain exists? And I think this is where I would sort of lean back on that biopsychosocial model. Consider in each of those domains, how do I help myself make sense of this? And then consider whether your sense of something bigger can also contribute to that. So the things I want to leave you with are some strategies to connect with meaning for yourself. So the first piece there, I think, is getting to know your values. Now, obviously, my talk was really focused in on this concept of religious and spiritual identity as a potential value. That might not necessarily be what resonates most for you. So I'm going to throw out a few words of values just to give you a sense of what I mean, that it can really be anything. Achievement, independence, personal growth, connection, optimism, creativity. Just a smattering of words. If that's something that would be of interest to you, I brought a list of like a much more detailed list of values that you can take a look at. So once you connect to your values, then find the activities that match that value. So connect. This is my. I move towards those activities. I also want to acknowledge specifically some strategies to increase religious or spiritual coping. So you might seek a supportive presence, whether that's an internal felt sense, whether that's a sense through some of the strategies we've talked about, whether that's a supportive presence with um, a community member that you can identify with. 
find ways to express your beliefs, again, that are consistent with your own values. You might want to explore some deeper held emotions in the context of belief in something greater. And then some other specific strategies, like I already mentioned, meditation, which doesn't necessarily have to be religious or um, specific to a certain spiritual set. Guided imagery. So some relaxation, some, some things that are affiliated with your own belief system and that are positive. Um, exploring music, reading, art, poetry. Those are other ways that people can address that. And I also want to offer you with some questions. I won't go in detail since you have the slides, but I want to offer you with some questions that might impact your own healthcare. Some things to think about, some things to maybe discuss with some of your providers. And then I will leave you lastly with this, which I hope sums it up nicely. All right, thank you.